So, when I'm talking about a film about dead people, well, where else am I going to film? Except for a place full of dead people. I'm Barry Mann, and it's showtime. Beetlejuice is a 1988 American fantasy comedy film directed by Tim Burton. The film tells the story of the Maitlands, a recently deceased couple whose home has been bought out by the Dieters and they want them out. So they make a deal with a bioexorcist by the name of Beetlejuice, only to find that the solution is worse than a problem. When the film was released, it was a critical and a commercial success. But what have I, the nitpicking YouTuber, found? Well, join me, Berryman, as I discuss 10 things wrong with Beetlejuice. Number 10. Batman. Michael Keaton plays Beetlejuice and he plays it fantastically brilliantly. However, it did nearly come at a cost. And that cost was his biggest role of Batman. Yep, this film nearly cost Michael Keaton playing Batman, the man who actually reinvented Batman. The whole voice changing from Bruce Wayne to Batman, that was down to Michael Keaton's performance. And we nearly never got that, all thanks to this film. Number nine. Ratings. I'm going to apologise to the American viewers because a lot of this is based around about the UK side of things, but there's been actually four different versions or official releases of this film. Now there's been two cinematic versions, one when it came out and another one in 1992. There was also a two different ver home entertainment and video on demand versions. Now, three of these are all rated 15. The original cinematic version, which comes in at 92 minutes, and then there's the two entertain home entertainment versions, which both running about 88 minutes. Why the cut if it's the same rating? Normally you cut things out to lower the rating. And this is where the confusion comes in, because the second version that came out in the cinema, which was in 1992, was actually released at a 12A at 93 minutes, even longer. So they've put more stuff in and got a lower rating. How does that work? Number eight, costumes. Now I know this section is titled costumes. I'm not really gonna say anything bad about the costumes because they are absolutely brilliant. In fact, kudos to Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin who spent the entirety of the shoot in the same clothes. But that's where the issue is. Not with Gina Davis, with Alec Baldwin, because those clothes are actually borrowed from another film. Three men and a baby. Two films further apart from each other than you would believe. But he is actually wearing the same shirt that Tom Selleck wore in Three Men and a Baby. Talk about cutting corners for your budget. Number seven, where's Beetlejuice? This is another thing I do say quite a lot in my videos, but when a film is titled after a particular character, you don't really see much of that character. And this film's no, no exception. In fact, Beetlejuice, bar a couple of little droplets here and there, doesn't properly appear in this film until the 45 minute mark. This film is only an hour and a half long. And what makes it even worse in regards to this film is Beetlejuice is only in this film for about 14 and a half minutes. Now, credit to Michael Keaton, because he has played the Beetlejuice so well, he is the most memorable thing about this film, but the fact of his lack of screen time, he managed to film all of his parts in two weeks. But we want to see Beetlejuice, he was the best thing about this film. Number six, Ghost Rules. Yeah, what are the rules of being a ghost in this film? I mean, Beetlejuice comes about by saying his name three times. Barbara seems to have these special powers. When she says home, home, home three times, she goes back home. But is that a rule? Do they have to do that? Why can some, they sometimes see the ghost and sometimes they can't see the ghosts? I mean, the biggest example is when uh, the Maitlands are in the office and they walk in and they see Barbara holding his head and the dead body, they can't see it, but she's holding a knife. Now that knife isn't hers, it isn't theirs. So that knife shouldn't be invisible. In fact, when the people walk in, they will just see a knife in the air. Why, why can't they see that? It doesn't make really much sense why some can do it, some can't, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. 
it is all over the place. Number five, how people died. One cool feature of this film is when you see all the dead people, you actually see how they all died. The girl that was chopped in half, the girl that sliced her wrist, the bloke that hung himself, and I don't want to know what actually happened to Juno with the great big slice across her neck. But the Maitlands don't really show how they died. Now granted, they did drown, so there was nothing physical, but wouldn't they stay wet? Now there is actually a behind the scenes reason for this is it, they thought it was going to be unfair, unpractical and really hard to pull off keeping the actors wet for the entire of the shoot but it doesn't flow on with everyone else's dying. They should have been wet. Literally, action, throw a bucket of water on them, let's go. But realism sometimes can actually add that little bit more to films like this. Number four, photos. So, as we are approaching the climax of the film, the Dietzes have this plan to turn the town into a centre of paranormal activity. Maybe I should do a film on paranormal activity. Anyway, got off topic. Their proof is these photos that are taken by Lydia to try and prove that the ghosts are real. And that is where the error lies, because she took the photos on Polaroids. How did she blow the photos up to A4 afterwards? Because Polaroids don't actually give you negatives that you could actually use in your darkroom to make bigger. They are printed there and then. You can't blow up a Polaroid. Well, you can in this day and age because you scan it, put it on the computer and do it that way. But back then, no, you couldn't. It's not really possible to do what she did. Number three, wedding clothes. So right at the end of the film, Otho is actually doing this weird chant thing to bring the Maitlands back into the real world so everybody can see them, just to prove that ghosts exist. Now, he actually says he needs something of theirs. So, one of the Dietz is actually trying to say, I know what we can use, and they bring out the wedding gowns. Where did they get the wedding gowns from? Because quite early in the film, they specifically says everything goes, except the stuff that was in the study. Now, we already saw that the wedding clothes were actually in one of the closets for the bedrooms. So they weren't in the study, so they weren't in the firing range to be saved. So where did they keep the wedding dresses? Why did they keep the wedding dresses? I mean, if I've just moved into a house where the people died and their wedding stuff was still there, that would be gone because that's inviting trouble. But why keep the wedding dresses out of everything in that house? Number two. Decking. After the Dietzes have moved into the maintenance house, they make loads of renovations. Now, one of them is the decking outside. It's basically a white floor with a white wall, one wall. That's it. And I will say, it looks kind of cool. In fact, me and my missus, when watching this film, both said we would actually like to have that. Except it is very dangerous because it's not a step off that decking, it's a big drop and no guardrails or anything. What's to someone have a few too many drinks? Bear in mind, these are New Yorkers that like to party and like to be hip. Having a few too many drinks and falling off. It's quite, not quite safe, really. Still looks good, though, and I still would have it, but it's still wrong. I'm confusing everybody here. Number one, Beetlejuice goes Hawaiian. It is a shame that we never got a sequel to this film. What makes it even sadder is there has been a sequel planned. It was planned all the way back in 1990, literally two years after this film came out. Beetlejuice goes Hawaiian. Everyone wants to do it. Tim Burton wants to do it. Winona Ryder wants to do it. And Michael Keaton still wants to do it. In fact, all three of those have actually said back in as far as 2018, they still want to do the sequel. Now, for some reason, this film has just been stuck in development hell. It's had various rewrites, it's had various people coming on board and off board, changing their minds. No one seems to really sit down and do this film, except for the producer and the actors who want to do this film. And it is a shame. I mean, as far as 2019, it was still going ahead. Unfortunately, the plug has been pulled and we're never going to get a sequel. However, we did get a sequel of sorts. We got the animated TV show, which is what got me into Beetlejuice in the first place. 
The problems with the animated show is one, he's got yellow hair. I'm pretty sure he had green hair in the film, but that's just being nitpicky, and I'm not on about the animated series. But he also was too of a good guy in the animated series where he was ultimately a jerk in this film. It's a shame we never got that sequel. So what do I think of this film? Well, ultimately, it is a good, fun, enjoyable film as an adult. Now, when I was a kid, I used to be a huge fan of the animated TV series. That's what got me into liking Beetlejuice in the first place. Now, the first time as a child watching Beetlejuice, I didn't quite get it. I didn't quite understand the jokes and Beetlejuice being the bad guy, I didn't like. So, as an adult, I do have a newfound understanding in this film. I actually understand the jokes, I get the jokes, stuff that as the child me, it went over my head. So it's actually an enjoyable film to watch. So much so, I managed to actually get my girlfriend's daughter to watch this film with us, and she laughed through the film as well. But then again, that child is quite sick and twisted. But that's another matter. The cinematography on this film is actually brilliant, especially when you take into account that this is a cheap film. It was actually done as a cheap film. Low budget, and it made so much money. Danny Elfman, you can see his Batman tones in this film, obviously, before he did Batman. A lot of the cast went over to do Batman afterwards, and you can tell it has the same feel, it has the same style. There's not really much wrong with it. I mean, I was going to put down that the overactingness of Gina Davis and Anna Baldwin, but because this is a cheap, funny, silly film, it actually flows with it. Now, I know Alec Baldwin isn't a big fan of this film and he hates his performance of this film, as, but I actually like it. It works. His goofiness and his silliness shows off and it works in this film. If he tried doing it seriously, I don't think it would have worked. But this film ultimately is about the Maitlands, it is about Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin, and Beetlejuice, the titular character, has been reduced to a background character, and that is what does let the film down. But overall, what am I going to rate this film? Well, because it is a cheap, cheesy film, I can't give it a 10 out of 10. It just does, it doesn't warrant that. But it ultimately is still a good film, so I am going to give it an 8 out of 10 berries. But that's what I think. What do you think? Did you enjoy this film? Do you hate this film? Let me know in the comments below and I'll look forward to reading more. On to next week. Well, we are going to do a film that is about rabbits and ducks and basketball. That's a bit of an easy clue. Come back next Sunday. Take care. Bye-bye.